Hi there, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. And as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 79, I believe it is, of Left Side of the Aisle. Uh, I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next, oh, half hour or so, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things important to me and that I think deserve your attention. As always, comments, questions, reactions, whatever, can be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And um, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up around here a couple of times during the show. And if you didn't get the, um, the email address, you can get it at the website. Uh, I do ask, if you send me email, that uh, if you would um, include... Uh, uh, Something in the subject line, like, you know, left side of the aisle, your cable show, or something like that, so that I know it's not spam, okay? All right, with those um, typical and rather standardized introductions out of the way, I'm going to start this week, as I like to be able to do, with good news. Uh, after seizing control of the Wisconsin State Legislature in 2010, Governor Scott Walk All Over You and his right-wing allies in the legislature, uh, legislature rather slammed through a number of good for the rich but lousy for the middle class laws, including one that stripped uh, unionized workers in the state uh, and state government of basically all of their collective bargaining rights. That law sparked a furious reaction. It involved uh, sit-ins and demonstrations at the state capitol for weeks. And um, it also resulted in three of the Gopper legislators in the uh, state senate being recalled and the Democrats regaining control of the state senate and nearly got Walk All Over You himself recalled. Well, what happened in, is that in September, Dane County District Judge Juan Colas uh, smacked down most parts of that law that uh, uh, stripped the stripped their rights law. Uh, he said that this law violated the free speech, free association, and equal protection of the laws, uh, rights that these people have under the Constitution. Now, the state asked him to stay his ruling while it appealed, during which time, of course, and appeals can go on for years on end, as you know, uh, the state would be free basically to act as if this law was in force, including tearing up union contracts and uh, basically ignoring people's rights. The good news here is that on Monday, October 27th, uh, October 22nd, excuse me, uh, Colas refused to issue that stay. Uh, that law remains on the trash pile, at least for now. The state uh, attorney general says he's going to appeal to the state court of appeals for that stay. And the thing is, logically, he shouldn't get it because the harm done to the workers by that stay is clear, while any harm done to the state is purely by not having a stay is purely hypothetical. So logically, you should not be able to get the stay, but when did logic have much to do with the law? So this may yet prove to be a temporary victory and temporary good news, but it doesn't change the fact that for now, it is. So starting with good news, as I like to. But from there, we're going to take a switch. We're going to go over to our regular weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. Now, two weeks ago, I told you about uh, David Siegel. He's the CEO of Westgate Resorts, who sent an email to his employees telling them, in effect, that they uh, had better vote for Romney because if Obama wins, he'd have no choice but to downsize the company, that is, to fire people. Now, I'm returning to that point this week because... Well, at the time, I told you that this kind of intimidation was not uncommon, it was not unknown. Um, well, I'm returning to it because, yeah, it's definitely not unknown. He was hardly the only case. On September 30th, for example, a man named Arthur Allen, he's the CEO of a Florida-based software firm called ASG Software Solutions. He sent an email to his over 1,000 employees telling them that their jobs were at stake. Uh, and Romney had better win. The, 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 bot, well, the, 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 the subject line of the email said, will the presidential election directly affect your job at ASG? The body of the email said in part that if Obama wins, ASG's chances of not being swallowed up by a bigger corporation were slim to none. Now why that's true was never explained and Threats are often more effective when they're not fully explained. So, thing is, Alan added that uh, when we buy a company, 
We eliminate about 60% of the salaries of, that, uh, of the employees of that company. And he said, if we're swallowed by a bigger company, the same thing will happen to you. So the message is, vote for Romney or 60% of you get the ax. And if that happens, he said, I don't want to hear any complaints about the, about the effects. But Alan didn't stop there. A subsequent email to those employees actually asked them, urged them, to donate to the Romney campaign up to the legal maximum. Donate as much as you can up to the legal maximum because this was to help ASG and yourself. And you probably won't be surprised to hear that the Koch brothers are also involved in this. Earlier this month, earlier in October, the 45,000 employees of Georgia Pacific, which is a subsidiary of Coke Industries, they got a packet in the mail, which included the voter information of, among other things, the Coke Industries endorsed candidates, all of them goppers, not surprisingly, uh, and a cover letter that said if the wrong people should win, quoting, many of our more than 50,000 U.S. employees and contractors may suffer the consequences. By the way, as a quick sidebar to this, uh, in response to the revelation of this, of this email, uh, Coke Industries released a statement that said, in part, and I'm quoting it here, any decision about which candidates to support belongs solely to our employees based on factors that are most important to them, and this in, is in no way an attempt to intimidate employees. Which, frankly, struck me rather like the armed robber who corners you in an alleyway, says your money or your life, and then says, but I'm not trying to intimidate you. You're free to choose based on whichever factors are more important to you. Well, anyway, the idea of employers trying to threaten employees, uh, making implicit threats against employees uh, in order to get them to vote the corporate line, this, this is not unprecedented, as I've said before, but the question is, why is it this year? Why is it so blatant? Well, one reason is that corporations are now in the position of figuring, hey, nobody ever touches us. We can pretty much do whatever we want. So, you know, who's going to say nay? Another reason, though, is that uh, this whole idea was openly encouraged, openly espoused by Witless Romney. Back on June 6th, when he was then a candidate for the nomination uh, for the Republican Party, it was in a conference call with this anti-union business outfit called the National Federation of Independent Businesses. He said, and I'm quoting him here, I hope you make it very clear to your employees what you believe is in the best interest of your enterprise and therefore their job and their future in the upcoming elections. So, yeah, there is another reason that it's happening. Your guy told you to do it. Now, Whitless assured his acolytes listening to this blather that this was all legal. He said, nothing illegal about you talking to your employees about what you believe is best for the business because I think that will figure in their voting decision. That is, yes, this whole vote the corporate line or you might get fired business is precisely intended to affect their voting decision. That is the conscious, that is the deliberate purpose of this whole thing. The thing is, it's still illegal for a company to directly tell employees, vote this way or you're fired. But this kind of veiled threat, this kind of, well, if, if, if our guy doesn't win, then, well, who knows what might happen to your job. Um, that's actually quite legal. How can this be legal? Why is this legal? Well, to use an old phrase that, uh, that I happen to like, to cap the climax, it's legal because of Citizens United. Citizens United, that abomination of a Supreme Court decision that opened the floodgates for massive amounts of corporate money to flow into elections, also overturned Federal Election Commission regulations that barred employees from, uh, employers from directly uh, campaigning among their employees. That prohibition was in effect specifically because of the potential for this kind of intimidation. That's a prohibition that no longer exists. So what we have here is another reason to despise Citizens United, another reason to regard Witless Romney as like most, not all, but like most members of his class as self-serving scum, another reason to recognize corporate America as propelled by nothing but, but uh, forever unsatisfied greed, another outrage, the outrage of the week. 
Okay, from there, we're going to move on from the, from the, from the uh, terrible to the absurd. We have this week's Clown Award, given as always for meritorious stupidity. This week's dishonoree is Iowa Congressman Steve King. Now, he's one of those people that in a sane world would not so much be laughed off the public stage as he would um, be gently removed and put somewhere where he could not do harm to the general intelligence of the body politic. And who, by the same token, make you despair for the future when you realize people actually vote for this steaming mass of putrefaction. Consider this. In, in July, he said that Obama's mother might have announced his birth by telegram from Kenya to Hawaii. This, this is the birther's explanation of why, if Obama was born in Kenya, there were actually two birth announcements at Hawaiian newspapers the next day. In August, he declared that liberals had so devalued life that, he said, a man can rape a young woman, kidnap her, take her across state lines, force her to have an abortion, and then drop her off at the swing set, and this is all legal in the United States of America, he said. Uh, later in August, he was one of the few goppers to actually openly support uh, Todd Aiken, that nitwit that said that um, women can't get pregnant from rape because if it's legitimate rape, a woman's body has a way to shut that whole thing down. Now, never one to be outstupided, King went further. He said he never heard of a case of anybody getting pregnant from statutory rape or incest either. But give him this. He is fully prepared to embrace his wacko wing nuttery. In an interview this past Sunday, October 21st, with a local TV station, he went right for it. He repeated his comparison of immigrants to dogs. He said immigration policy should be like a dog buyer picking the best, uh, the pick of the litter. And what's more, he insisted, this is a compliment. He dodges earlier birther statement saying he was just relaying the concerns of others, but then added that he doesn't know where Obama was born. He doubled down on the case of Hama Abedin. Hama Abedin is a woman who is a uh, chief advisor to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, and, and she's a Muslim. And he insists that she is connected, that Abedin is connected to the Muslim Brotherhood. He calls this um, the objective truth. He actually urged an investigation and hinted that this supposed Islamic influence on the State Department had something to do with the Obama's policy in Libya. Finally, he said, he has no position on whether states should be allowed to ban the sale of contraceptives. Not ban abortion even, ban the sale of contraceptives. In the course of this, he suggested that the, that the Supreme Court case called Griswold v. Connecticut, this was the 1965 case that actually established a right of privacy as a basic constitutional principle, he suggested that that was wrongly decided. And he did all that literally in four minutes. Truly a tour de force of clownishness. Iowa Congressman Steve King, recognized by the Southern Poverty Law Center as one of the 15 most extremist candidates running for public office in the United States in 2012. Stephen King, clown. Uh, we're going to take a break right now. And we're back. Hey there. Um, rest of the show, I've got two things to cover. One is um, i got a couple of updates on this thing about voter ID laws. I know I've been talking about this a lot, but I think this is a really, really, really important issue. So I have, uh, the thing is, supposed voter fraud is the excuse the right wing is using to suppress the voting rights of liberal-leaning constituencies like, you know, minorities and, and, uh, and the poor. Well, two weeks ago, I told you that we'd finally found some voter fraud, but unfortunately for the right wing, uh, it was committed by Republicans. Uh, in Florida, a, an outfit that was hired by the Republican National Committee to do voter registration was found to be turning in phony registration forms. Well, now I have a little more bad news for the wing nuts. 
On Friday, October 19th, a man working for the Virginia Republican Party was charged with 13 counts of destruction of voter registration forms, uh, disclosure of voter registration information, and obstruction of justice. The guy's name is Colin Small. Uh, and he was caught throwing out these registration forms because he foolishly threw them in the wrong place. He threw them into a dump, threw a bag of them into a, into a dumpster that was for the private use of a particular company. Turns out that one of the employees of the company saw him do this, got annoyed because he wasn't supposed to be throwing stuff in there, and decided to investigate what it was this guy had thrown away, and he found the forms. Uh, now, the sheriff's office, the local sheriff's office uh, in Virginia, said there's no indication that this activity was widespread in our jurisdiction. And maybe it wasn't, but as several people have pointed out, there's really no way to tell how many additional voter registration forms were dumped there or somewhere else in the state over what period of time. Uh, you know, maybe there were none. Maybe there were hundreds. There's absolutely no way of knowing. Now, the Virginia Goppers were all, of course, shocked, shocked to discover this was going on in their state. Uh, even though they had already fired the outfit that was found submitting the phony registration forms in Florida. By the way, Small, he used to work for that company before he went to work for the Virginia Republican Party. And something I want to point out here, because this is important, this destruction of voter registration forms, this is far worse than filing false registration forms. Because, like I said two weeks ago, unreal people living in unreal addresses are not likely to show up to vote. What you have here, though, in this case, is you have real people at real addresses who really thought that they were registered um, and are going to go to the polls and discover they're not. This also, by the way, the fact that this keeps people from voting makes it several orders of magnitude worse than the all but non-existent crime of in-person voter fraud, which is the only thing these photo ID laws could actually address. Now, the other thing uh, I wanted to mention uh, about, um, about voter ID laws I mentioned a while ago that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court had overturned a decision by a lower court judge. Uh, that lower court judge had allowed Pennsylvania's voter ID law, which is one of the most restrictive in the country, to go into effect. The court sent the case back to that lower court, the upper court did, with instructions that in effect told the judge, you have to enjoin, that is block implementation of this law, at least until after the election. Well, this judge, whose name is Robert Simpson, did that in the first part of October, and that's good news. What I wanted to tell you about here is that that good news is heavily tainted by what Simpson did. See, in that new ruling, Simpson said he was going to let the good parts of the bill stand. As a result, you don't need a photo ID to vote in a Pennsylvania election in November, uh, and you'll be allowed to vote with a regular ballot, not a provisional one. However, you will still be asked for ID, even though you don't need it. What's more, and this is what's really, really offensive about Simpson's ruling, it allowed the state to continue its educational campaign about voter ID, where they were running ads uh, that actually told people that you needed a photo ID in order to be able to vote, and he allowed them to continue doing that. In fact, the state had a, had a uh, TV, TV ad what it had was several different people saying, uh, do you want, to have, you want to have a voice? Do you want to take a role in the election? Do you want to have a say? Well, then, and then they, these various people were flashing their IDs going, show it, show it, show it. The only change the state made, it took them a couple of weeks to do it, the only change the state made to that ad was to add the line, you will be asked but not required to show an acceptable photo ID on election day at the end of it. It's the only change they made. In short, both Judge Simpson and the state of Pennsylvania have gone out of their way to do as little as possible. They have gone out of their way to affect the operation of this law as little as possible. They have done as much as they can get away with to still hint, to suggest, to give people the idea that no photo ID equals no vote. That idea is so much in circulation that last, um, last Thursday, October 18th, a newspaper in Pennsylvania published an article that said that photo ID is required to vote. And a week before that, 
uh, several thousand seniors in Pennsylvania got a mailing from a program that is administered by the State Department of Aging that told them a photo ID is required to vote. It's bad enough and the state's response has been slow enough and sluggish enough that last week the ACLU went to court and asked the court to order the state to stop sending out false information. Remember, we're talking now two and a half weeks before Election Day, and we're having to ask to not send out false information. Now, I have to tell you, I don't understand why there's not more outrage over this kind of voter suppression. I really don't. I don't understand how and why this, we as a nation move so easily and so quickly from how can we encourage more people to vote to how can we keep people from voting. Um, can it really be that that many people in this country just take the idea of voting that lightly? Or perhaps is it that they hear the right-wing fantasies, the horror stories, the, the fantasies and fables of voter fraud and go, oh sure, why not have voter ID? Because after all, they already have the ID and so it doesn't affect them and they don't care if it affects anybody else. This issue won't end with the election. It's going to remain an issue. The right wing knows that its best chance to hold, to maintain and hold political power, and I don't mean just to influence political power by virtue of money and, and social status, but to actually hold the reins of government, their best chance is to restrict voting as much as possible to the elites. Uh, there was a time in this country when you had to be a white male property owner in order to be able to vote. Now, that's, I don't see that returning, although I actually can see the right wing arguing that only property owners should be allowed to vote because they're the only ones with a real stake in the community. The thing is, even though I can't see you know, that the kind of extreme position coming back, I can see a real chance of us becoming a society where those who most need society's support, the elderly, but also, you know, even more, the poor and minorities, that the people who most need society support, not only as a practical matter, but actually as a legal matter, are the least able to gain that society's attention. That must not be allowed to happen. You know, one of the supposed ethical principles of our judicial system is that it is better that ten guilty people go free than one innocent person be wrongly punished. Now, don't get hung on the exact ratio like I've seen some people have. The basic principle is that saying one, guilty, one innocent person being wrongly punished and uh, one guilty person getting away are not moral equivalents. The former is worse than the latter. All right, apply that principle here. Cases of in-person in voter fraud, which again, the only kind these photo ideas could, ad could address, they're minuscule. A recent study turned up only 10 proven such cases in all elections nationwide since 2000. Even alleged cases are no more than in the hundreds over that same period. By contrast, Recently passed voter restrictions, some of which have been blocked or, or knocked down by, by the courts, Recently passed voter restrictions could have disenfranchised something over 5 million otherwise eligible voters. So the standard here we might say is better one person get away with in-person voter fraud than 500,000 people be wrongly denied their right to vote. We've got to face up to this as a nation. And I mean, I, think, I mean this sincerely. I, our, our right to a government of, by, and for the people is at risk. We are at a real risk of becoming not just as a, uh, not just an effect, but an actual fact, a plutocracy, ruled by the elites, ruled by the rich. And don't think this is just something out there. This past spring, there was an effort to get on the ballot in Massachusetts this fall, a, um, a ballot initiative about, about photo, uh, photo ID in Massachusetts. Now, it didn't get anywhere, but the point is that ID is also circulating around here. Don't think we're immune from this. There are a lot of reasons to criticize our government, a lot of reasons to criticize our political process, including it's captured by big money, the insistence of the media on treating political campaigns like, like sporting events, and the incredible narrowness of the choices we get presented. There are lots of reasons to criticize. The ability to vote is not one of them. All right, last. Last for today. I've got a few minutes for this. George McGovern.
former member of Congress, former senator, 1972 Democratic candidate for president, um, longtime advocate for peace and against hunger, died this past weekend at the age of 90. George McGovern was the first major party presidential candidate I voted for. Uh, I can safely say that he is the only major party presidential candidate I voted for without a mountain of reservations. It's not to say I agreed with him on everything, but it does mean that I felt confident that I could trust in his basic decency, his basic honesty, his basic commitment to justice. Forty years later, I have no reason to change that assessment. I found it disappointing, hardly surprising, but disappointing that everything started with his 1972 loss to Nixon. And a lot of it didn't get beyond that. Now, yes, that was important. Yes, it needed to be mentioned. But why treat that as if that was the summation of the whole man? I mean, was this just a way for our modern blasé, sneering, world-weary world media to dismiss him as some kind of Don Quixote? McGovern actually failed to recognize the importance of image, even, even as early as 1972. He was dubbed the son of the prairie of South Dakota, was dubbed some kind of hippie by the Republicans, and he never really responded to that. I doubt more than a fraction of the voters knew that in World War II, McGovern was a, was a bomber pilot, that he flew 35 combat missions and received the Distinguished Flying Cross and the Air Medal. But don't ask that. Don't ask what people might not have known then. Ask what they might not know now as a result of reading this coverage. They might know he was an early and vigorous opponent of the Vietnam War, they might know that. But would they know that he co-wrote, wrote or co-wrote 14 books, the last in 2011? Would he know that his concern for Native American rights was such that the Oglala Sioux called him the Great White Eagle? Uh, would they know that, and they wouldn't know, that he was a prime sponsor of the Food Stamp Act in 1977 that created the food stamp program as we know it today? They wouldn't know that even more than Vietnam, hunger was the issue that drove him. He was the first director of the Food for Peace program. He helped establish the UN's World Food, Pro food Program. He was the first uh, chair of the Senate Select Com uh, Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs. And later on, he became U.S. Ambassador uh, uh, to the United Nations Agency for Food and Agriculture. He co-created the International Food for Education and Nutrition Program. In 2001, he was named the first UN Global Ambassador on World Hunger by the World Food, food Program. So people would know any of this because the media was too busy trying to reinforce the image of a hippie loser. During the floor debate in the first bill he introduced end of Vietnam War 1969, he said this, I'm quoting, every senator in this chamber is partly responsible for sending 50,000 young Americans to an early grave. This chamber reeks of blood. Every senator here is partly responsible for that human wreckage across our land. Young men without legs or arms or genitals or faces or hopes. There are not very many of those blasted and broken boys who think this is a, a war is a glorious adventure. Don't talk to them about bugging out or national honor or courage. It takes no courage at all for a congressman or a senator or a president to wrap themselves in the flag and say we're staying in Vietnam because it's not our blood that's being shed. That's the George McGovern I remember. That's the George McGovern I voted for, the man who knew the meaning of conscience and never sold his. History, it said, is uh, rightly said, is often is written by the winners. But the trouble is that often means that history pays attention only to winners and losers and not to, to what endures. Conscience endures. That's it for the week. R.I.P. George McGovern. That's it for the week. You have the best week you can. We'll see you next week.